Uh, so I just went through and just installed everything that we we normally would with uh, Tag Manager Analytics. Um, built a remar remarketing tag, installed it on the site. <clears throat> All the good stuff. Um, I want to talk about conversion tracking. Now, conversion tracking, there's variances that are not necessarily static for every CMS, every content management system. WordPress is going to be different. WooCommerce, BigCommerce, it all is dependent upon the e-commerce um, site itself. Now, I'm going to give you an example for Shopify, but this Shopify example is going to be changed for each one of the CMSs. And I'll give you an example, and then we'll provide a, a, a helpful tip on how to identify this exactly. So inside of um, inside of the Google Ads dashboard under tools and conversions, when you set up your conversions, last time we did this, we did it right through the, the Google Ads app. This one we're gonna set up manually. And we're gonna click new conversion. And the conversion is going to happen on the website. We're not going to be importing it. It's not a phone call or an app. Uh, it's going to be a purchase conversion. And inside the purchase conversion, we're going to create an action. This action is going to have a category. And so this category is going to be called purchase. And you can leave this purchase or, or you know, purchase items, wherever it is. Uh, and I'm going to open up the chat to make sure. There we go. Um, purchase uh, conversion name is purchase. The value, we don't want to use the same value because you know, unless you have one product on your site, and you know, it's always going to be the same product then, then you can use this one product or one, one conversion value. But we're going to be using different values for each conversion because it's going to be dynamic. You have to enter in a default value. Again, this should never come up, but we'll just use the, the one default value. Count, this is an area we're always going to count every because people can make subsequent multiple purchases. You know, if they have three ad clicks over a month and they purchase three things, if you use this as one, counting one, it doesn't mean that you're only going to count it, you know, uniquely one time per person. It means that it only count one time for that, that person. It won't count again. So you want to count every, this is make sure that, uh, and it gives you a little, a little snippet here. If someone clicks on your ad and completes two separate purchases on, on different occasions, two conversions are recorded. That's what we want for e-commerce. Now the click through conversion window, my opinion, and I don't see anybody really combating this that much. Uh, I don't know why, but people usually default to, to 30 days. I default mine to 90 days. 90 days because I, so this is like how um, Facebook went from the 28 day attribution window down to seven, Google can go to 90. So if they click at any time in the next three months they buy, it's gonna go back to, it's gonna track that person all the way back to the time where they originally clicked. So 90 day window, in my opinion, there's no reason to stop counting earlier than that. Um, I don't, I don't see a real reason that that should be, that should be counted less than 90 days. I would like, I would love to have identity if I could, um, view through conversion window. This I usually set again to 30 because you can look at view through conversions. Now the, and I'll, I'll share with you here, um, next inside of the conversion action settings. And I can only show you this after it's set up view through conversions are now counted in the all conversion tab. They're no longer easily counted inside of the view through conversion window. It's it doesn't make sense, but where Google has now moved it, they still have an old column that's just kind of left over. So I'll show you where to find the view through conversion. So YouTube and display discovery, all of those are going to be especially remarketing. All of those are going to be really important to identify in the view through conversion window. Again, I like to use it at least 30 days because if someone sees an ad, I think let's see at 32 impressions before a purchase or before an action takes place, those 32 impressions might take you know longer than a day. So I usually like to have uh, always really nuts when other agencies recommend 30 days made so no sense to me always err on the side of more data exactly. I don't know why you would want to you'd want to know less information. So I always like to do it as long as I possibly can because then it gives me a full scope of everything that's going on. Can I pause there just briefly John on the view through conversions. Yeah the the smart shopping specifically is such a batch and blast mechanism and you're going to get so many um impressions we had a client who had 500,000 brand impressions within the the case of like it was 60 days or something it was unbelievable mm -hmm. but what we see happen is whenever we run smart shopping campaigns we see branded searches begin to go up and they go up consistently over time and what that means is people are seeing your logo your favicon your url your brand name um possibly your face and your voice uh depending on what it is that you're using and then they're 
their interest in you is improving. Well, according to Google, upwards of 30% of all conversions are what's called assisted conversions, meaning Google can't necessarily track the session ID all the way through. So view through conversions where with other Google ads mechanisms aren't are quite as important with smart shopping, I think become exponentially more important because there's so many more opportunities for them to be exposed to your brand, not click. So they view, they haven't clicked and then convert elsewhere. So I fight view through conversions in some instances from some agencies, depending on the marketing mechanism with smart shopping, I'm on the view through side. Yeah, and uh, and and Marianne had a great question. She said, "If uh, if we did everything you showed them through your Shopify, do we need to do anything with the conversion things now?" No, um, you you don't. If you did everything in three X Shopify, you're good to go. Uh, again, that was that that three X Shopify was a, a complete like up and running. This is just a manual way of doing that in case you know in the future, let's say conversion tracking breaks on your site or whatever it may be. This way, you have the knowledge on how to set up conversion tracking. Um, this next tab include in conversions. Absolutely. <laughs> this is the only one I would say you have to, no matter what, you always have to include in conversions. Attribution model. This gets a little bit uh, a little bit more granular, but there's a lot of different attribution models. You have data driven that usually pop pops up after you're spending about 10, 15 to 20 thousand dollars per month. Um, but the attribution model that I like most often for an e-commerce, uh, account is first click. It's very different than probably what you'll hear. Most people say either linear time decay, um, data driven when you can, position based is sometimes good, or always you know last click as a default. No one really likes to talk about first click. I love first click, and here's the reason why. With smart shopping, smart shopping is going to be heavily outbound as well as inbound, but it's usually the first time a person interacts with, with your brand when it's an e-commerce type of company. Now, last click and, and time decay might work really, really well for lead generation. My, um, it's uh, the costume say t uh, time decay all over YouTube. Yes, and that's actually, I usually like time decay on lead generation. For e-commerce, first click is is oh, our kind of new go-to. Why are you calling me out, Osama? What is this? It costs them just, 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 just turn off your camera. Well, <laughs> no, so it's funny. Oh, good. We used to say time decay for smart shopping. Yeah. We changed what? December, January? Yeah, it was actually probably even later than that. It was actually probably more like February, March. Um, and now we're, again, we're, we're learning and evolving. Um, and I think that is probably something that is, is uh, something that's constant. It, if you visit this same uh, group next year, we'll probably have some minor tweaks just because well, we I find we that, do. you know what I yeah. mean? Otherwise we're obviously not doing our jobs. So yeah, I think, right. I appreciate you bringing that up though, Osama. That's really helpful. And it shows people the evolution that we've gone through in figuring all this crap out. Yep. Um, yeah. And the reason why I like first click is because if in what we're going to be teaching, we're going to be, te we're going to be teaching you to run a brand campaign. And in that brand campaign, that's where people come back. Now, when people come back through a brand campaign, you're going to have more weight and attribution given to the brand campaign in time decay than you would on a on, on a first click. Uh, and what this means is that if I first click is, and I'll give you an example, first click on smart shopping, I go to the website, I'm like, that's really cool. After I talk to my significant other, whatever it is, I'm going to buy that. Later on, two days later, if they Google your brand because they're not gonna they're not gonna wait for a smart shopping ad and they're not gonna Google the same keyword that they did when they first found you, they're just gonna Google your brand name and come back. On that second visit, when they come back two days later, uh, they buy. So in time decay, it's gonna say, well, I gotta split the conversion and I gotta give more conversion value to the most recent action. Well, what is that? Your brand. So let's say on the course of two days, 60, I'm just gonna use round numbers. 50% it's not going to be, it's going to be more like 65, 66% after two days. But 50% of the conversion value is given to brand, 50% of the conversion value is given to smart shopping. And you said, okay, so this $100 purchase, I only give $50 worth of credit to smart shopping, but smart shopping, you need to make a 400 ROAS. And it's going to say, well, I, I made a 200% ROAS because you took half my conversion value away. So I can't get there. I'm going to start limiting spend. So by using first click with smart shopping, you're gonna have a high degree of, of interactivity at smart shopping. You're gonna have on an average month, if you're spending five grand a month in smart shopping, you're gonna have 800,000 impressions and maybe 2,100 clicks. Now, if any of those clicks ever come back to the brand, you're gonna take half of or three quarters or possibly 90% of the conversion value and give it to the brand campaign. Brand campaign is gonna look awesome. Smart shopping is not gonna be able to meet its goal, even though it did all the work to get it there in the first place. So for e-commerce, 
we now recommend first click because you can give all of the conversion value to smart shopping for it to meet its goal even though they came back through the brand me personally if i see them coming back through the brand great you know that's that's good that's i can see that in top conversion paths i can see that in there's something flying around in my office sorry i can see that in top conversion path i can see that through click attribution i can see all that there but i'm giving my my campaign that I have a very tight restriction on a very high goal, I'm giving it the proper weight for it to uh, meet those goals. So um, that's what we recommend for first click. Does anyone want me to touch upon any of the the conversion or the, the attribution models? Because I can talk about each one of these, but didn't know if it's gonna be helpful. Cosmo, what do you think? Yeah, let's talk briefly about why we liked time decay previously, because that mm -hmm. was the gold standard for us. And then we moved to first click. And I just want people to know why we chose time decay and then why the transition. I actually kind of already explained the transition, but talk just briefly about time decay. Yep. So time decay is going to uh, is going to split the conversions and it's going to give more of the conversion value to the to the action that was taken last. And the longer that timeline, the more the conversion value weight becomes heavier on the end. So as an example, in two days, it's going to split it 50-50. In three days, it might split it 60-40. On you know, 10 days, it might split it you know, 20-80. So what I what we used to say with time decay is because Google's seeing the traffic, it's going to see that a person came in through smart shopping and then came back through brand. And it's going to say, okay, that was a good person. That, that, was a, that was a good audience and they purchased and I could see that their path. So we're essentially believing that the algorithm would see it come in from one and then convert in, in second. And that was, that was enough knowledge for Google to say, yes, they do come in through A, they convert on B, here's the time lag. Um, is, is 12 days and we give the proper attribution. And then we found out we weren't necessarily meeting our ROAS goals. You can still use time decay if you set a lower ROAS goal, but you have to deal with a fluctuating time decay um, model because it depends on if it's a three day purchase versus a 10 day purchase. The first click might give 80% or you know 50% of the value or 15% of the value. So you have to kind of fluctuate a little bit. So it was a little bit difficult to manage. Well, time uh, decay had a distinct ceiling too in terms of the search volume that was available to us. We would run a campaign, it would be successful, but we'd hit a ceiling and we weren't able to expand out of that. It was really frustrating. And then mm -hmm. John experimented with first click, and because first click is user acquisition, like all of a sudden the 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 size of the pool that we were the pond that we were fishing in became much bigger. Um, right. Thomas got a good question. Wouldn't data driven do that for you because it knows smart shopping is the key factor in the conversion? Wouldn't it get much more weight, and the rest leading to conversion get less? Yes, that's that's correct. And that's in what's interesting is though is I have seen it where it actually favored the brand because the brand had a better conversion rate, lower cost per click, better cost per conversion. I mean, everything was better in the brand because it was like you know half the people that clicked on the brand bought. So it was like wow, this is this is this is the conversion um, the conversion campaign. And because Google doesn't read that, oh, that's their brand, it just says this campaign is performing really, really well. We started to see data-driven, and I love data-driven. Data-driven was, if I ever could use data-driven, that was my go-to until I started hitting ceilings on my smart shopping campaign. Because I'm like, well, all right, then give it a 250% goal. Now I can scale. But that 250% goal, since we're an agency, when the clients say, hey, why am I losing money? on my smart shopping campaign, we're like, no, 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 you're not. It's just coming back through here, look at top conversion path. And we literally had to add up dollar per dollar in top conversion path by saying smart shopping to brand, 280, smart shopping to brand, 260, smart shopping to brand. And we had to physically add that up and then deliver a report. Um, but then we said, well, if we switch to first click, you know, the smart shopping campaign can meet their goals, can scale quicker and the client was happy. So that's the, it's, it's, if you're more, and some of you, you're probably more an advanced user, you can use pretty much, you know, any, any, um, attribution model that you'd like and just adjust your goals accordingly. Um, even if it's CPA goals, like on search, you might have a CPA. If you have a half of conversion, your CPA is double. It's not just, you know, oh, I got to have a conversion and my cost per conversion is, is X. It, the, the cost per conversion is actually 2X if it's half a conversion because it's a simple mathematic equation. So if you're using CPA, again, you're going to have to do the same thing as your return on ad spend goals. So that's why we use it like first click is because if they come through this uh, search campaign and then smart shopping remarks them and converts them, the search campaign should get the credit because smart shopping is also heavily going after new users and it's getting its own credit. So that's why I kind of like first click because I can kind of see where is that where is that intro to our, our brand. Um, have you ever set up multiple accounts all under one MCC and set up specific campaign types within each account so they can use attribution model that Michael, uh, we actually have a fairly large company. 
I can't give their name out because they're not the client. They're a a friendly company that spends, let's just say they spend about a million dollars annually uh, just on YouTube, another million dollars annually just on display. Um, they are using uh, two different Google Ads accounts. One is spending about $2 million in just display, and the other one is spending about a million dollars annually in just um, search and shopping and um, at the end, search shopping and remarketing. Uh, but the other one that's going outbound display and outbound YouTube to pure cold traffic, they have two separate accounts. The issue he's running into is the, the he's duplicate accounting, but they're, and, and again, this is him. I, I, I said, I'm not sure if that's going to work because you're going to have to use one tag manager because that one tag manager is going to have to be tied to one conversion action. And that conversion action that you have an ID in conversion action is, is your one tag manager going to know which account to send it back to. Because once it counts a conversion, it sends one GCLID. If you have a view, um, a view through conversion on YouTube and then a click through conversion on smart shopping, is that still going to pass through two conversion actions? He goes, I don't know. We're trying to figure that out now. And so he's 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 got he's like I have he's not as technical as I am. He goes, I don't know. I have a team working on this, and I'll let you know how it goes. We we check in each quarter. And so I said, if you can figure that out, that's pretty amazing. But I don't think you're going to be able to, because whether you're, if you're having a view through conversion and then a GCLID, is it going to send a view through and a GCLID? I don't think it will. Um, and so he's, he's testing it. It's not fully up and running yet, but that's, it, it's something that um, we were trying to figure out. Well, if I just had one campaign going to pure cold audience looking at view through conversions, I can measure the, um, I can measure the performance of just my outbound cold traffic campaigns that is not going to be stolen by uh, different attribution models inside of my smart uh, search or smart shopping remarketing. So we have the same idea. He's testing it now. Uh, it's been about two months. He hasn't figured it out yet, but we're we're getting probably close. So I'll, I'll keep you posted. <laughs> uh, it'd be cool if they let us assign our attribution models on a campaign level. Yeah, I know. I really wish so. I really wish that they would they would allow us to do that. But again, uh, hopefully someday. Anywho, that's first click. Uh, and let's create and continue. All right. Oh no! Don't do this to me, Google. Sometimes if I talk too long while setting up a conversion action, it makes me do it again. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to do this faster this time. Somebody uh, time, how fast can John set up a conversion action? Uh, all right, 30, 90. Set oh, no, oh, now I'm getting nervous. Do we know what the defaults are that Shopify sets up when it builds out conversions? Yeah, they're uh, last click. Okay. Um, so we'll go through and we'll, we'll show all that here. Uh, first click. No, oh, it already exists. Fine. You. This might not work. Oh, there we go. Okay. So we're going to skip tag manager. We're going to skip email the tag. I'm going to show you how to set up the tag itself. The reason is, is this is a very, very simple way to do this. And it's very um, reliable. This is actually what the Google shopping, uh, Google ads shopping integration does for you. They actually just set up the tag right on the website. It doesn't go through Google Tag Manager and then come back through. It has the same functionality though. It's still Google Ads tracking. We're just not going to be implementing it through Tag Manager. The reason why I like doing this this way is because it's more universal uh, for CMSs. If you have sometimes a tag, uh, tag Manager installation in the header, you have to go through and identify uh, and set up essentially kind of like regex expressions inside of Tag Manager to find your cart uh, confirmation page and then and then hopefully it's it's modified through there. This is a same exact tracking. It's not like an analytics importation versus Google Ads tracking. This is still Google Ads tracking. It's just a little bit more universal, a little more simpler, and exactly what we we taught in 3x Shopify. Uh, well, exactly the same method. So I like to use the install the tag yourself. And now here's what is is going to have uh, a few different a few different um, choices here. There's C code for AMP and HTML. If you're using AMP, you're going to select the AMP one for your AMP pages. Standard implementation is going to be through HTML. Now, global site tag, this is where uh, the global site tag isn't installed on all your HTML pages. Um, global site tag is installed on all pages, but comes from a Google product. The Google, a global site tag is already installed when you created another conversion action uh, in this account here. What we're going to be choosing is this one here. The global site tag isn't installed on your HTML pages. This is essentially saying this is a cold installation. Now, this here, this is your Google Ads tag installation. This part here is going to have to go into your header. If you've already done this, you're going to be choosing one of these options. We're going to assume you have not. 
So this is the global site tag that is installed on all HTML pages. When you grab this global site tag, this is going to go in the header. If you're on WordPress, in your theme editor. If you're on Shopify, I'm going to do it now just because I have a Shopify site. If you're on BigCommerce, again, it's going to go into your header. And this is why it's a little more universal is every single website has a header code. Even if you're on WordPress on a custom theme and you don't have the editor, it's most likely in your theme settings into just header injection. So this is the area that's going to go right into the into the header. So I have that here. I'm just going to refresh the page to make sure this doesn't have the same stalling that I just had. OK, so inside the header, you have the uh, Google Tag Manager here that's firing our remarketing code. Uh, this is where the global site tag is going to pop up into your header. And I think, uh, do I have, I think I might have another global site tag. Hold on. Okay, no, I don't. Okay, perfect. So that global site tag is going to go in the header here. And then the next part is going to say on, I would do on page load. Don't do on click. Um, on click gets really, there's a whole reason, a bunch of reasons why you're not going to want to use the click on page load. Uh, or sorry, the click on, on the event snippet, you want to do it on page load because in e-commerce, the page that's going to load is your thank you page. It's going to be that, you know, hey, thanks very much for your order. That's going to be the page that you're going to need to track. Now, where that page lives is, is going to be different for every CMS. And that's where usually if you're doing this kind of yourself and you're, you're hopefully you're not custom building a site yourself and you have no idea where this is. If you're custom building, hopefully you do. Um, if not, and you have a web developer, this event snippet here is going to go on the purchase conversion page, which is the which is the the carts thank you page. Thank you for your order. You're going to copy this code here, and inside of Shopify, we're going to go into settings, and then we're going to go into checkout, and then down here it's going to say additional scripts. This is if you want to do it manually. If you already done this in 3x Shopify, you're done. It already installed it in the theme for you. If you if you don't want to use the Google Ads app for whatever reason, or if you if you can't use it because you used it before, it's going to go right here on the additional scripts. And it says, any customizations you'd like to appear on the order status page on the checkout? This is where we need to customize this code a bit. The customization of this code, again, being universal, this is the Shopify's custom codes. Now, here's what's, cool, what's, what's different is when it shows the you know value of one, one Dollar. If you never touch this code, every purchase that takes place on your Shopify store, if it's two hundred thirty-seven dollars, is going to come out as one dollar, because that's what the code says, and that's what's sending back into Google Ads. It says, "Hey, we're going to send this back to Google Ads. Here's what we're going to send back: a blank transaction ID and everyone purchasing for a dollar." This is the reason why this is a little bit hard to do for everyone. I don't have all the codes for big commerce, full commerce, customs, you know, Shopify. This is something that has to be has to be uh, customized now. There's a team called Google's Tag Implementation Team. They are a little slow sometimes, um, or sometimes even non-existent. Sometimes you have to chase them a little bit. But so if you don't, if you email them and don't hear back, just kind of be the, the squeaky wheel that gets the grease because they're just an open, free um, team at Google. But not, not a lot of people know about them and they're not publicized. But Google's Tag Implementation Team will actually do this for you. And all they do is when you reach out to them, uh, and you can use it from the Tag Manager's help screen. You can reach out to them. They'll email you and say, give me A, B, and C. Usually it's like access to backend access to your website, yada, yada, yada. Once you give them backend access to the website, everything that they're going to need, they hop on and they literally just share a screen and says, okay, go here, paste that there, click this here, click save. And then they take over and they, they test and they say, yep, everything looks good and you're done. So Google Tag Implementation Team will, from basically here on out, be able to do all of this for you. If you have a custom website, if you're doing this on your own and you don't know exactly what's going on. So just lean on them. But uh, hold on, let me grab that. Oh, there it is. So this area here is the, this is what we need to, we need to update. So this here, check out total price, money without currency. What we're going to have to do is this part here is going to have to be replaced with that. The next part is going to say shop currency is going to replace this in here. Shop currency is going to be right there. And then transaction ID, again, Shopify uses order number. Big Commerce, I think, uses like order ID. Uh, you know, WooCommerce can be using, you know, transaction order number. They're all they're all different. So that's why I can't give you a standard implementation. 
Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll chat those codes here in a moment. Uh, so order number is going to go right through here. So this is how this has to be set up. And it's going to be set up this way. Now, this is going to be able to take, oh, the value. This tells the theme, take that, that checkout total price uh, and give it the money without currency. So it's not going to have a currency symbol. And then send that back into Google Ads. And then Google Ads is going to take the number and say, ah, this is what, this is the purchase conversion. Currency is going to take the shop currency. So if you're, regardless of country, um, it'll just take your currency and place it back into Google Ads. Now, just be mindful that you're using the same currency on Google Ads as, as your shop. And then order number is going to send the transaction order number back into Google Ads so it can match with GCLID. So that's how you'll set up the additional scripts here in, in Shopify. But if you're in any other you know, CMS, that's how you set up conversion tracking here. I'm just going to click Save, setting saved, and we're good to go. Any questions on this so far? <laughs> There's my old one. <laughs> Let me remove that. There we go. Okay, so now you have your purchase conversion. So that's that's essentially conversion tracking. Now, there's other ways. Oh, uh, that's where I had to put in put in percentage if first time access to avoid duplicate counting conversions. Yeah, and that's it's interesting. Shopify already has that built in. Um, it's so interesting. They already have the code essentially that if you click on the thank you page and you can refresh the thank you page like 600 times, it still just counts it as one time. It doesn't refire that code. Um, not every CMS does that though. Not every theme does that. And that's where this gets a little bit interesting is not only is it CMS, it's also theme driven. So it depends, like custom coded, we have this another company that says Letterman Jackets. They were sending every single conversion action a whole bunch of times and the percentage if first time, first time access uh, wasn't working for them. Um, they must have fixed it because in 2018, that was a big problem for us even on Shopify. Yeah, yeah, that was a big issue. Um, and the Shopify, apparently, it, it, things got noisy enough there that they actually fixed that. But if there was an issue there, if people would like, if you would email them uh, your confirmation code, and then that confirmation code brought the person back to the thank you page that had the tracking information on there, it would just count that sale again. And each time they visit, all of a sudden you see like the repeat rate of like 300 and all of a sudden you're like, why is it say I made $6 million today? It just got, it got insane. Um, so Shopify fixed it, um, but not every, uh, not every um, CMS has. So Michael, I appreciate you dropping that code in there. Uh, is it better to remove a conversion you're not using or change including conversions to know, are there implications to one approach to the other? Well, uh, Don, would you mind let me know which one you're talking about just so I can I can, I can discuss just because I think that it, it might be yes or no answer. Oh, well, I was just, I was just uh, noticing that you changed the one that you first set up to remove versus just changing conversions to no. And I have a couple of duplicate conversions in my uh, account. And so I was just trying to decide which approach might might be better if that makes sense. Yep. So if you have a duplicate conversion, there's reasons to leave that in there and reasons to take it out. Uh, and that means either removing it or not including any conversions. Uh, let me see if I can pull up an example. Um, so here's here's what's interesting. This is a duplicate transaction here. And on the transactions, you have this transaction coming from analytics this transaction coming from the way that I just showed you now. You'll see that if you look in the last 30 days, the analytics tag says, hey, we made 261,000. The purchase from the website conversion tracking that I showed share with you said, hey, we made 394. They're both on 90 day click throughs. Obviously this one I included in conversions, this one I did not because otherwise you're going to add this plus this equals 656 and we're going to have the same issue that michael johnson had where it says that the agency looked really good but cost you a lot of money <laughs> um so again you only want to include it one time now the reason why this is use this is this way um the purchase is because analytics is a same day attributed network and this is, again we're in master class so here's i'm going to share with you some some cool cool ninja stuff. So Google Analytics says it's a last click attributed network. What did they do and how did they come back? And that's how I'm going to attribute that sale. So if someone comes back directly organically referral and Google Analytics can't 
count that person as ever coming to the website before, like let's say from a Google ad click a week ago, they've been here before, and they come back directly, Google Analytics says, okay, someone came back directly and purchased. That wasn't Google Ads. Don't give Google Ads credit. The purchase conversion that we set up is 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 last click. It, it doesn't care. It doesn't it doesn't matter if they ever click on an ad and then later on ever purchase through any other marketing medium, direct, organic, referral, social, email, doesn't matter. Google Ads will count it because it says, hey, I had an influence in that in that journey. So if you have and there's and you can see the huge delta between these. Um, that's what is that like fifty grand. In the last 30 days, that analytics said that, that those 50,000 people that came back and purchased came back probably directly or organically and didn't give credit to Google Ads. So Google Ads says, no, they came back directly, but they started here. So I give them credit. The reason why I count them both, though, is because if there's ever a site speed issue, Google Analytics fires faster and, and first before any sort of conversion actions fire on every website that I've, that I've ever seen. If you look at the, the data layers where they fire, the snippets that get fired, it's always analytics and then anything else and then tag manager uh, and then event conversion tracking is later on. If your site speed is slow, let's say nine seconds, let's say it's a nine second load time, even though first contentful paints two seconds. So the end user thinks it's fast, but you're actually loading all of the codes nine seconds later. What ends up happening is analytics fires first and then seven seconds later, the person leaves. And then nine seconds later, after the person's gone, the conversion tracking would have fired, but the window has been closed. So analytics sometimes on slower sites has better conversion tracking than tag manager or than the conversion uh, purchase conversion because it loads last. So by the time a person hits a thank you page, you're like, yep, I bought, perfect, and then they're gone. Well, if they would have waited four more seconds, the conversion linker and conversion tracking would have fired and it would have had the data. Now that's on slow sites. On Shopify, we don't see that issue. This is not Shopify, so I always put a, a secondary barrier, basically saying like, if one code failed, at least I have a backup, but I'm not gonna count it in conversions. So is there a reason to have duplicate? Well, are the sources different? Is it a slow site? Is one analytics and one web? If it's just two of the same ones, then just remove the one. Got it, that's hugely helpful, thank you. Yep, you got it. Um, perfect, so that's the reason why I always have a backup, I just don't count it. So that I can hop in here and see, yep, you know, I have a duplicate conversion tracking the website you know let's say theme ch changes and crashes i don't lose all of my conversion tracking analytics is my backup even though it might be less i can tell my client hey don't worry we're still spending 50 grand a month you're okay your website crashed in the code i'm still tracking everything get it fixed and let me know when i can re-enable this and they're like oh thank you otherwise i'm gonna be like hey everything stopped and it's been two weeks and we got to restart from scratch and then our clients hate us well not hate us they just wish that we would have been smart enough to figure this out cool um, what is next on here? Um, so that was the conversion. I'm going to skip the Google ads app for Shopify. Let me just, let me go through some Q and A's. I'm seeing they're kind of, they're, they're kind of piling up here a little bit. Oh, uh, Don, uh, oh, Don, as long as you don't have yes include. Yep. So some of you're right. Um, if you don't, if this is marked to, to no, then you're good. If it's marked to yes, um, then you're going to have two, two things added up and then what it's going to look like you have 656,000 in conversion actions. If there's ever a time where you're not sure, I'm just gonna give you a quick quick hint. Under segment right here, you can click conversions and conversion action, and it'll tell you what's being counted. And you'll see that uh, in my conversion tab, these are all zeros. And then I'm counting purchase, I'm not counting transactions. So in my conversions, I have 1,002 and that's 1,002 here. If you segment by conversion action and you see that, oh no, there's purchase, place, and order, and transactions, these again, in not to badmouth any other agency, these were set up before we got here and they were set up wrong. So they just, I just never did anything with them. Um, but you'll see that ours here is tracking this and I'm not tracking anything else. If you see something here and here on your just main screen, when you click segment by conversion and action, then you have a duplicate tracking issue or hop into your you know tools and conversions and see if any of them are marked as yes. If there's multiple marked as yes and they all have conversion value, then you're, you have some issues. Um, you're duplicate tracking. That speaks to something Michael said earlier in the chat. He said, maybe the agency we were using look really good, but cost us a lot of money. Yeah, but exactly. There's, yeah. there's ways to, to, you know, faux track and to report on vanity conversions. And if you're just looking at the dashboard wholesale, it looks good, but at the end, of the, you're not actually making that money. Um, in, inside of the conversions, you're going to see your purchase conversion here. In your purchase conversion, click on web pages, and this will tell you 
what's being tracked. And it says, okay, $199. And if you take that URL and you open up a new tab and you go to that, it should say $199. So that's how this thank you page here is sending in the card value is $199, sends it back to Google Ads and Google Ads says, hey, I just tracked $199. That's good. All these should match up to all these thank you pages and you should see the unique orders themselves. This page here says, hey, this was tracked and this is the amount that was tracked. And you can cross reference to them, cross reference them to each individual one and say, yep, this looks good. So that's a way of, uh, of, of testing it if you'd like to. When Scott Cunningham gave his presentation, he said something that I thought it was really funny and B, I'm going to steal in the, for the future and pretend that I made it up. But he mentioned he runs Facebook ads for people. And he said, you know, people who try Facebook ads when it doesn't work, they'll come out and say, oh, Facebook didn't work. And Scott goes, well, I'm pretty sure Facebook did its job. Like, I'm pretty sure Facebook sent traffic <laughs> to your site and then the people didn't buy. Uh, and while that sounds petulant, I can tell you from the, the ad agency side, that's our opinion internally. Even if we don't voice this as readily to our clients because we don't want to get yelled at or get bad reviews. If we run ads for you and it doesn't work, as long as we did our job, we don't feel bad. It's just like, oh, people don't want you got, right? Like they didn't want to buy the thing that you wanted to sell. So the viability of your product is on you. And again, I wouldn't say this as aggressively to clients, but y'all are y'all are sort of in the inner circles. So you need to know how the agencies think, because really right now you're the agency. The reason Lucky Orange and things like it are so important, we can only get you half, you know, it's the whole you can bring the, the horse to water thing. We can only get you halfway there. If you do notice a campaign begins to fail, I can tell you that the ad managers throw our hands up pretty quickly. And it's like, gosh, you know, we did everything we're supposed to do. We went through the 90 days and you can see the amount of work that we go through. It's not as though we're like phoning it in. Um, but then it's on you to say like, okay, what are some things that are happening that might not necessarily be product related that are inhibiting a potential conversion event? And that's why this process here is so important. Yep. And uh, Michael Johnson, you said, uh, sorry if I missed this, but are all those conversion actions from Google Analytics UA coming from the Shopify Google Ads app? So no, the Shopify Google Ads app will automatically do the process that I just taught. It'll actually place it on the checkout pages and send that trap, that code back into Google Ads the way that I did it. It just does it for you for each one of the add to cart, complete, started checkout, you know, add payment information, checked out, like those type of things, search for a product, all those conversion actions, they build those codes in on the right page. The reason why I did that is because not everyone here is on Shopify Plus. And Shopify Plus, if you were to do that manually, you can only do that manually on Shopify Plus because it doesn't give you access to all of your, like, there's no checkout.liquid unless uh, you're on Shopify Plus. So the reason why I taught it in the 3X Shopify that way is it's universal for all Shopify users. Uh, but the way that you would import from analytics is you'd have to go into here, where it's the plus symbol in conversions, and then you import from here. And then you import from your Google Analytics property. And then when you click continue, now you have to be linked to your analytics right now. I don't have any uh, events to import because they're all imported already. But if you had um, events or if you had goals in analytics that you built, you'd import them through here by just selecting them from the list, import and continue. And then once you import and continue, it looks like this. We're like, okay, they're coming from analytics now. You've imported those goals and events from analytics. I don't like using events because events are not necessarily always perfect. If you set up perfect events like chat, chat events, when they when the chat pops up, depending upon your chat provider, when that chat pops up, it's counted as a chat. Well, if it's counted as a chat when it just pops up and no one ever interacts with it, that event is incorrect. So just make sure that your events and your goals are, are set up very, very well inside of your analytics account. And if you if you like those, you can import those. But again, since analytics is a same day attributed network, whatever happened that day gets the credit you're gonna see a discrepancy between the Google ads conversion tracking, which is what I set up here on this call versus what analytics says actually happened. And there's sometimes a very large discretion. We usually find 30% of your conversions are missed if you're importing analytics only. You wanna use a Google ads conversion tracking app because they come back directly organically from email. Google ads will still capture that analytics. Most of the time will not. Um, and I'll give you an example. Here's, here's a good, good example for everyone here that this is the reason why analytics is not a good conversion tracking source. It's, it's a funny way of, of looking at this. Let me, uh, I'll just pull up, um, I don't know, I'm gonna pull up just a random account here. Here's what everyone would need to kind of ask themselves is in the last you know seven days here, if I look at direct traffic, 
this says, hey, out of the 1,100 users, 1,008 of them, basically 100 users are, are brand, uh, or 1,000 users are brand new. Only 100 people came back. Well, that's kind of, that's kind of hard to imagine that since February, as an example, you're telling me that 16,208 people that came to my website, 16,178 of those are brand new, never went to my site before, new users, and they came back, and they came to my website directly. So 16,000 people just woke up since February and said, hmm, I wonder if this website exists, and then types in the URL perfectly. That doesn't happen. They've had to have come from somewhere else, an organic that has a return traffic. Um, those new users, this is what Google Analytics is going to use to say, well, hey, someone came back directly and they look like they're a new user. That wasn't Google Ads. Don't give them credit. So that's where this, this is the reason why Google Analytics is a lot of times a bad source for conversion tracking for Google Ads, because unless it's here in Analytics, unless it says paid search, it can't be organic, it can't be direct, it can't be social, it can't be referral. They have to be in this column here for Google Ads to get the, to get the credit. But not everyone is a one click and buy uh, type of user. A lot of them aren't. So you wanna make sure that, and, and Google Ads still, or Google Analytics will still track this in what they call the top conversion path. And top conversion paths, again, we're in the master class, so I can go a little bit deeper. This here, pay search to direct, Google Analytics will count that. Google Analytics will see, aha, pay search to direct. There are 7,300 people. Give that credit to pay search. But these direct that happened 2,200, again, <laughs> I guarantee you that these people didn't just, 2,200 people didn't just wake up and say, I wonder if this website exists. They had to have come from somewhere else. This would not be counted. And a lot of your Google Ads can, uh, users that come back directly will be missed because of this reason here. John, can you show, uh, specifically for an e-commerce client that has multifaceted conversion paths, can you show one that has like really robust conversion paths just so people can see some of what you end up digging into from a data perspective? Oh, this one here, this one's, they have conversions, uh, conversion value. So this is technically e-commerce. Um, but you can see that they get insane. Um, like paid search, three direct visits, a paid search, two direct visits, a paid search, two direct visits, a paid search, seven direct visits, and then they convert. <laughs> and the further you go down, the crazier it gets. Um, so I'm looking at 5,000 lines, two direct visits, two referral visits, seven direct visits, a referral visit, direct referral, 29 direct visits, and then a conversion. <laughs> so you can imagine people do a lot of things. This person had to come back 31 times directly before they before they converted. Um, and there's, you know, again, omni-channel, so direct to paid. To, uh, so it was like, I found you organically, then remarketed from paid. Then I came back directly, then remarketed through paid. I double checked that I want to do this. I saw, I came back probably four more remarketing ads, and then I converted. This stuff gets really, really, really far and wide. If you're relying on analytics to catch this every single time, you're going to miss 30% of your conversions. So that's the reason why we, we always like to use the Google Ads conversion tracking, not analytics. Can we play devil's advocate for just a minute? Yeah. I'm thinking about what Ed Leak said about yes. uh, dads being a little hungry or a little yeah. what, How did he phrase it? Yeah, a little, a little greedy. A little greedy. Yeah. <laughs> so Ed, Ed Leak challenged me on this one. Uh, he said, do you think that Google Ads conversion tracking is a little greedy? I said, yes, uh, but by design. Where this gets greedy is if you have a person that clicks on a Facebook ad and comes to your website, and then a person clicks on a Google ads remarketing ad and comes to your website, and then someone clicks on a Facebook remarketing ad and comes back to the website and buys, Google ads is going to say, that was me. Facebook is going to say, that was me. And now you have one purchase and it might, you might have spent, you know, let's just say everything equal. Both networks spent $2 and both networks made $4. In reality, you spent $2 here, $2 here, so you spent $4. And you've also made $4, so now you have 100% ROAS rather than a 200% ROAS by channel. My pushback on that was a lot of our clients are not really necessarily omni-channel, which they're not running you know, 20 grand a month on Facebook, 10 grand a month on Instagram, 20 grand a month on Reddit, $15,000 a month on LinkedIn, and then 20 grand a month on Google Ads. If you do that, um, Google Ads conversion tracking is going to count a conversion that may have converted on another platform like Facebook or Instagram, but they did have a click on Google Ads, but it wasn't the last click in all of the channels that brought the conversion. However, if you're using analytics, 
you're going to still have the same issue where Facebook is going to have a click. Google ads is going to have a click and then they come back directly and purchase. Google ads is going to say that was me. Facebook's going to say that was me. <laughs> and then analytics is going to say, well, that was direct. So now you're just not attributing that conversion action to Google ads, even though Google and Facebook both had equal hand in, in converting that user. So it's up to you. It's up to you what you want to do. I like Google ads conversion tracking because as I scale, and if I want to start other channels, I know that my Google ads has been running quality, but again, it can be greedy because it doesn't necessarily mean that someone last converted on a Google ads channel. It just means that Google ads had a click, not a view, had a click attributed um, sale somewhere in that path, in that funnel. Carlos is asking, could you also analyze this with the model comparison tool? Yeah, yeah, you can. Uh, model comparison, again, it's, uh, let me reopen that. It depends on, again, if Google Analytics can identify that. But I love model comparison tool because you can compare, you know, first click versus last click by channel and then see the lift. And you'll see direct all of a sudden has a huge lift. So, so check this out. Um, Carlos, I love that you, you said this. I think that uh, not a lot of people know the model comparison tool. But if you said, well, let me see the first interaction. I'll go through this a little bit better versus the last interaction and in a 90 day window here since February, you'll see that all of a sudden paid search says, hey, my first interactions were I had 166,000 conversions. Let's just use uh, transactions because that's that's crazy. There we go. So paid search said, OK, person first came to my website. That's 10,000 uh, 10, conversions that are attributed to having paid search be the first interaction ever to your website. And they had a CPA of 38. Uh, cost per acquisition of $38. You can even say conversion value ROAS. Uh, if you want to use an e-commerce model, say, hey, it's been 279. But the last interaction was only responsible for $948,000 in conversion value at a 246 ROAS. So it lost 11.8, which means 11.84% of the people that started on pay search finished somewhere else, finished either directly. When you'll see direct, look at this. Direct had 93,000 in conversion value since February. I don't believe it. I don't believe $93,000 are just people waking up one day and first going to my website with a direct, typing in the URL directly, not ever clicking on an organic link or anything like that. But what you'll see is look at the people that come back, 100% more people. They come back through direct when they purchase 100% more than when they first quote unquote arrive there. So there's a lift there of almost $100,000. And you can see this, that the last interaction people come back directly. And you also see display organic referral. People come back or they at least have a last interaction with your website uh, through the possibly remarketing. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and then organically, if they just type in the brand name, like typing in the brand name um, rather than just going back to the website directly or referral, this one is actually a false positive. The referral can sometimes be a payment processor. Payment processors like PayPal, Afterpay, QuadPay, you know, all the firm sometimes are counted as referral uh, referral traffic. And what that means is that when someone is checking on your site, if they click the PayPal link, it goes to paypal.com, they fill out all their information, they click pay, and then PayPal sends them, sends you a person. And then that person is now checking out, well, where'd that person come from? Well, PayPal just sent us a person that bought, and that happens a lot. A good way to not have that happen is to go into the admin, go into the, uh, Where's my, so I'm having a brain fart here. It's a referral exclusion list. There it is under tracking info. Sorry, <laughs> it's been a few months since I've had this. Uh, referral exclusion list, and then you can just type in a referral exclusion list here. So you can add like, you know, paypal.com or, or any of the URLs. And those URLs would be found in, uh, in your acquisition, all traffic channels. And then you want to click on referrals. I don't know if this is actually happening. Um, yeah, that's the AMP project, and then um, and then Amazon Pay. So right here, Amazon Pay. So app, basically, using the Amazon payment portal is worth twelve thousand five hundred dollars. Well, it's kind of weird. They have a sixty-one percent conversion rate. That's because when people click on pay with Amazon and they come back to the site, there's money attributed to it. Again, we use Google Ads tracking. We don't use Google Analytics tracking. So this is a non-issue for Google ads that we run for them. Their, their analytics just needs to be updated a little bit here. This is probably something that's fairly new, but that's how you would do it is use, grab that URL, that, that source there, add that as a referral exclusion list, 
and then it goes back to the previous step of whatever the source was before that. Michael asked for a resource to show how to properly set up detailed goals manually in analytics. I dropped in Mercer's company. Is there anything else you'd add? Um, no, I have to say Mercer is a really, really good, uh, I love that person. He's, he's amazing. Um, I hope everyone thinks that I'm, I'm fairly smart in Google ads. So like when I am to Google ads, Mercer is tracking, um, just some odd level, you know, expertise. Um, so I would say Michael is at measurement marketing is fantastic. Um, yeah. Uh, we, John and I had, and you all hear me say this a lot because I'm arrogant, but we had the highest performing real estate investment campaign on the planet for seven years. We sold an agency in June of 2019. That agency existed because of something Chris Mercer taught us. There was, John created this insane black box and there was one dot we couldn't connect from a tracking perspective. And, and Mercer was the one that connected that dot. He's you know part of the reason that agency existed. So um, a little bit of, of his time is worth a lot. And he's got really good certified partners too. Um, Dylan said, this reminds me of something, should we be using linear attribution for omni-channel conversion tracking via Google ads? Well, unfortunately, Google ads will not track other sources. So if you use linear, um, the attribution model inside of Google ads means how is it attributed only to Google ads campaigns, not how is it attributed to Google ads and Facebook and Instagram, et cetera. So when you choose a attribution model, it simply means inside the closed ecosystem that is Google ads and my four campaigns that I'm running, how am I going to attribute to only these four campaigns? Not how am I going to attribute to maybe one of these campaigns and then also Facebook? It doesn't speak to any other sources. It just, the, the attribution model in Google ads is channel specific, only channels Google ads. So hopefully that helps. Mike asked a question that's going to lead to a little bit of a conflict of interest. He said, is that the problem that high roast or wicked report solves? Uh, Mike, John and I are early stage investors in a company that solves this problem. Um, they're called North Beam. And just so y'all know, like we're we're in bed with them. So yeah. this uh, is this is something like if you're like, are you affiliates? Like we're we're, we're owners. <laughs> we're owners. Yeah. So um, it's it's dangerous for me to I, I'm not gonna bash either high rose for wicked reports, but I can tell you that if they worked, we wouldn't have ponied up. I mean, we 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 paid, we invested to be a part of this organization. Um but it's it, not, it's it's going to be like, I mean, some crazy awesome stuff where, you know, how much does your Facebook and what campaign interact with other Facebook campaigns? How often does Facebook and Google ads interact with your email? So they had, they opened up the email, opened up that, opened up that, opened up that, then this, they'd searched on this campaign, then dynamic brought, remarketing brought them back for two visits and then they made one purchase one time for $467. So I, I'm not going to bad mouth anybody. But what we have been able to do that Hyros and Wicked Force has not been able to do is use a third party cookie that's like Switzerland and uses your actual money in the bank to use the attribution reporting. So where Wicked Reports and Hyros have said, well, this channel says X, this channel says Y, we believe it's Z. We said your bank counts is Z and based on the click attributed conversions, this is where those those have come from. And then we build our own custom attribution model. So we have an attribution model that we get to uh, essentially choose. And then using the attribution model, um, you can actually, you can say, hey, everything that's first click attributed, give 80%, everything else give 20% and, and then build it out that way. And then you can find ROAS and CAC and LTV and all the other stuff. So I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this because it's gonna turn into a sales pitch with all of this thing, but, um, this Nordby model has done what what Hyros and Wicked Reports can't. What we found is that Wicked Reports and Hyros gave a third story. So Google Ads says one story, Facebook says another story. Wicked Reports said a third story, and it still didn't line up. Um, and that was my issue. And I, I I have nothing bad to say about Wicked Reports. They are fantastic. I've met them back in 2017 at TNC. Great, great, great guys. They're doing really, really a lot of fantastic stuff. Um, in my opinion, it was just a different story that also didn't line up. So take that for what it is. Awesome.